Hello everyone and welcome back to Realism Overall Sandbox in Kerbal Space Program 1.3.1 where I'm continuing my shuttle constructed Mars mission. These launches all occur during live streams on Twitch and the music is from a shuffled playlist so sometimes it fits great, other times not at all. We've actually finished construction of the main mission, the main habitat vehicle, and now we just need to resupply it as it's currently in orbit around the moon. That requires the use of a centaur stage inside the shuttle, which is a bit complicated and of course pushes the payload boundaries of the shuttle. It also has an additional problem, as you can see the payload is sort of popping out there and that's because the centaur stage is on an uh, infernal robotics hinge and the hinge didn't really have a very good grip on it despite auto strutting. So uh, you can see the payload poking out and the problem with that is not just aesthetic, it is also the balance of the shuttle, especially when we get to this point where it's really far out of the shuttle and it's pulling the center of mass higher away from the external tank. And that's a position where the shuttle's main engines can't point through. The shuttle main engines are pointing a little bit down uh, through a point between the shuttle and the external tank. So if the center of mass is pulled further up, they can no longer control the shuttle, and that's what happens here as the shuttle starts deviating upward. And I'm aware of the problem, uh, I'm very aware of the problem, and I'm just waiting for the appropriate time to cancel this. And, um, well, basically, when it's pointing straight up, that would be a good time. So, stop, stop, stop. It can no longer hold it. And. Fortunately, we are at a periapsis where the shuttle can complete orbit, so there's an abort to orbit situation. But the fact that the payload is swinging around like that causes a bit of a problem because as soon as I release the external tank, it becomes a new vessel, which means it can collide with the payload. It just cleared right there. Somehow we managed not to have an explosion. And the shuttle took a while to actually get oriented properly. But, there's a lot of time to apoapsis because we have to dispose of the external tank anyway, you know, on a suborbital trajectory. And the best way to do that is leave a lot of time to apoapsis for the OMS burn. So the shell already had some time to ensure that it could do an abort to orbit. And uh, here we go. What we're carrying up this time is just a tank of methane and oxygen for the OMS and RCS on the Mars mission. Unlike on other missions where OMS and RCS means sort of the lower thrust end of things and the main engines provide higher thrust, of course on the Mars mission the main engines are the ion engines, so the OMS and RCS are actually the higher thrust stuff options that we can use for quicker burns. But they don't provide as much delta V, so we have to watch out how we use them. So here we go, attempting to deploy the payload the small methane oxygen tank on the tug on top of the centaur stage and the infernal robotics part wiggling um, yeah it's just not gonna go well and many many hijinks ensue at least nothing explodes but you can see how small the methane oxygen tank is compared to the tug for instance and that is one of the main reasons why I decided to design my own tug is because this tug is not part count efficient. It's also not particularly efficient overall because it's using hypergolic fuels instead of methane and oxygen. And of course, if our goal is to transfer methane and oxygen to the mission, we might as well use a methane oxygen tug. So that's what I ended up designing. Uh, that will make things a lot simpler and ensure that we optimize how much we deliver. Uh, of course, if we're delivering xenon gas, it's not quite as good, but uh, it's still useful to use methane oxygen instead. But anyway, the Centaur stage managed to transfer the payload to the moon as planned. I should note that that Centaur G is not currently part of Raider Next US Rockets pack. I was incorrect about that. That'll be added later on down the road, but Raider Next is a little bit busy right now. He tossed me the part because he saw what I was doing and figured it might be useful. Otherwise, I would be only using the Centaur G Prime in that pack, which is the bigger Centaur stage. And so you can't easily put a... You'd, we'd have to dock the payload to the Centaur stage in orbit uh, in order to make that work. So despite the fact that there was an abort to orbit, uh, we did 
managed to bring the shuttle back. Uh, there was enough fuel to get into its standard orbit for re-entry, so that I could use the KOS re-entry script. And as you can see, we are coming in on a runway landing with um, with my usual kind of velocity, <laughs> unfortunately. Again, I blame the lack of proper air brakes on this. I should just put the stock air brakes. It might, but then again, it won't look right. But neither does landing at this velocity. It's a toss-up. Maybe you guys can tell me whether I get to use some alternative air brakes or not. I don't know how to fix the air brake on this. Control surfaces in in Kerbal Space Program are still a mystery to me. I haven't made any control surface part yet. Or aerodynamic surfaces for that matter. Anyway, but uh, there we are. We recovered the shuttle and of course now we have to manage the rendezvous. And this was another reason why I decided to make my own tug because um, it was clear that we would need a lot more Delta V for Rendezvous than I initially thought. And because I used a boxy core for this particular tug, because I was trying to imitate the, the TRS, the Skylab TRS, um, it's not really mass efficient. I eventually try and make a mass efficient one, but it still, it still wasn't good enough. So that was a reason to design my own little space tug. And of course, this isn't optimal for docking this sort of payload anyway. Uh, for a station payload, it's okay. Of course, you would still want like extendable RCS booms or something. I don't even know how those are made. But anyway, we are attempting a rendezvous. And right when I get there, I basically run out of fuel. I had, you know, exactly the right amount of fuel, I guess you could say. But ultimately... It wasn't safe to attempt the docking with the fuel I had left, so I was going to have to deploy one of the tugs currently on the station. And that's another thing, the part count on each of these tugs, each of those four tanks arrayed around the center is actually three parts. There's a top part, a center cylinder, and a bottom part. So that's 12 parts, and then there's four solar panels on each, and then two docking ports, uh, four... Uh, four of the four-way RCS ports, and then uh, four of the one uh, single-directional RCS ports. And I think all told, um, there's also a reaction wheel and the core. All told, I think there's like 28 parts, 26, 28 parts or something like that. So it's pretty hefty on the part count. And you can see right there in that uh, view, there's four of these tugs. So that's more than a hundred parts just on the tugs. And that contributes to a lot of lag, as you've noticed, around our Mars mission, and we just can't deal with that. Just the tugs seem to have about as many parts as the mission itself. So that was another impetus for designing my own tug. Anyway, here we go with another mission. And once again, we were using the Centaur stage on an IR hinge, but I had initially hypothesized that the reason why it was flexing like that was because I was using a procedural part between the Centaur stage and the IR part, the hinge, and that turned out not to be correct. <laughs> so here I tried to replace that procedural part with a regular part uh, to see if it wouldn't, uh, you know, bounce out of the cargo bay, and the answer is no, that would not solve the problem as you can see. Uh, you might have also noticed this is the first use of pad 39A. This is from the real KSC pack. I hadn't used it before, and it takes some adaptation. You can see the role program didn't actually go to where it ought to have gone. Uh, the KOS script was not expecting the particular orientation of pad 39A, so I have to work on that. That'll be fixed on the next launch. Uh, this particular launch was actually trying to carry some crew over to our mission because we needed engineers to be able to add re radiators to the methane oxygen tanks on the mission itself because our radiators had exploded, if you recall. Uh, unfortunately, it's sticking out of the cargo bay and causing the same problem it did before, but earlier because this is actually longer and so it was flexing the center of mass even further away from the external tank and so we our fuel situation is even worse for abort to orbit right here. Uh, that is a Dragon capsule, a Dragon 2, on top of a small service module to capture around the moon because Dragon's own internal fuel wouldn't have been enough. And then the Centaur stage. 
Uh, we had to put the two Kerbals in the Dragon Capsule immediately because um, their tools are in the KIS inventory and if there isn't a Kerbal in that seat, the Kerbal doesn't get those tools. So I had to make sure the tools were there and so they were in the pod right away. I mean, in terms of abort options, it wouldn't have made too much of a difference. Anyway, uh, releasing the Centaur stage is just always a pain. And boink. But we're trying to get the payload into orbit separately from the shuttle because of the fuel situation. We couldn't get them in orbit just using the shuttle's OMS. Figured that out pretty quickly. And so it's going to have to use the Centaur's own fuel in order to complete orbit here. And of course the Centaur, the RL-10 engines have multiple ignitions. And there we go. Note that uh, we just use regular staging to light those engines. This is going to come into play in the last launch of the video. So I was just able to press spacebar and it lit those engines properly. And here we are making orbit, so it's not great as far as the situation is concerned. Of course, using some of the fuel of the Centaur stage means it has less fuel to rendezvous with our target mission, about 300 meters per second less. Um, the shuttle also made orbit, but barely. And that's going to be a problem because we can no longer rely on the KOS script to get us back to the KSC properly, given that it's in the lower orbit. So here is TLI, and you can see the Centaur stage ends actually about 400 meters per second early, so we have to use the service module that was originally intended to just um, rendezvous with the station and perhaps deliver some methane oxygen to it because it is a small 30 kilonewton methane oxygen uh, engine uh, burning at 360 seconds ISP. And uh, yep. Here we are, and we have our rendezvous. Now, the Dragon Capsule does have some of its own fuel for the Super Dracos, and so it can use that to help with the rendezvous if we choose to do so, and we will. So here, I'm actually doing all of uh, this pod's maneuvers before we even get back to the shuttle. The shuttle ends up being in orbit for like two weeks while this is doing its business. We had enough food, water, and oxygen, thankfully. But you can see the number of burns that we have to do. Um, yeah, so at this point I think we are on the Super Dracos instead. But I didn't want to decouple the service module because it's got the solar panels. So... Yeah. Also, the Super Dracos tend to impart a bit of a roll on this model. This is from Tundra Aerospace. I don't know if they still do or if it's just a problem in this version. So we managed to get a rendezvous with the mission, which is still in a very high orbit around the moon, and that makes it awkward to line up with it. And unfortunately, we basically run out of fuel right when we were about to dock again. <laughs> Same situation as with the previous mission, uh, pretty much exactly. Now, if we hadn't had to complete orbit with the Centaur stage and didn't have to use the service module in order to uh, do that burn, uh, to complete TLI, uh, we would have probably had enough fuel to just dock properly, but as it was, I had to use a tug, and there's a lot of lag around the station right now with all these tugs, uh, to just go ahead and grab the Dragon Capsule and pull it into dock. Uh, right now, it's got that methane oxygen tank on it, but that's empty because I transferred the fuel out. So I'm just putting that on a suborbital trajectory to crash into the moon. We're pretty sure there's no life on the moon that's going to be disturbed by that. And then the Tug is going to try and grab the Dragon Capsule. So, pulling our crew into the station. Note that these Tugs use MMH and Mon3. We still have some Hydrazine Tugs, which are the initial iteration because the real TRS had Hydrazine as its fuel. We still have two Hydrazine Tugs on the station that we need to get rid of. MH and Mon3 is the fuel for the Orion command module and its service module. And that's why that is one of our baseline propellants. Uh, you heard that explosion. <laughs> and and I, I had accidentally turned to the tank, the floating tank that's crashing into the moon and had to turn back. And when I turned back, the, the little tug exploded along with the docking port. And it said that the docking port collided with the other docking port. 
Um, even though we had docked. We had docked properly. I made sure of that. And... Yeah. Well, without a docking port on the Dragon Capsule, there was only one option, and that was to EVA the Kerbals to get them into the station. And... Uh, I believe they did carry their inventory with them. So that's good. But yeah, obviously a suboptimal sort of situation here. But as long as the Kerbals get to where they're going safely, it is all right. Our two Kerbals crewing the IMM initially are Bobby Factor 69 who is actually a viewer on Twitch who was recruited. And I'll try and do some more of that. And then a regularly recruited Kerbal, Pat Lee Kerman. So those are our two initial crew. The, the mission has three years of supplies for four Kerbals and so six years for these two. We could easily resupply it. Um, a single shuttle mission should be able to send up enough food, water, and oxygen, even assuming that they're going to be on here for like a full two year duration before a Mars mission. Like if the Mars window was right now, and we had to wait another two years to transfer it out to Mars, um, they would st it'd still be relatively easy to replenish the food, water, and oxygen. Anyway, uh, here I am trying to deorbit the, the obsolete hydrazine tugs. And that one is on a suborbital trajectory, and then I bring the MHM Mon 3 tug back. I think after we do this, you'll see the frame rate difference in the vicinity of the IMM. It'll be much better, a much more pleasant experience doing stuff around it. And on this hydrazine tug, we had the A-pass uh, facing the outside. So we, even though it's out of fuel, we had to let it drift so that this tug, which doesn't have an A-pass, it just has the common berthing mechanisms, grab it on that, on the correct docking port. In terms of lining up, that was not a problem actually. Uh, we did get the this tug lined up with that tug and had the docking ports touch. But then we had the rotational problem. And no matter how I manage the rotation, it's got this weird docking port snap thing on it. And whatever I tweaked those numbers to be, however I rotated these, uh, it didn't seem to work. And so I just tried to push it out of the way. <laughs> I just tried to shove it a bit. Uh, that didn't work great, but it was all I could do. We were getting a little bit late in the stream and I just wanted to get it over with, I suppose. So back to the IMM with this little tug as the other tug floats away and docking this on the nose. I was a little bit worried that uh, this docking board was just bugged, that uh, it just wouldn't dock with anything. Uh, that proved not to be true. It managed to uh, dock to the station again. And so now we have two tugs. One is currently on the tail end uh, where we grabbed the propulsion section. Remember the propulsion section had lost its RCS fuel. So we had to use the tug to grab it and it's a sandwich in there. And then this tug up front. Hopefully we can get rid of these two tugs and further improve the frame rates around the IMM. So here we go, deorbiting the shuttle finally. Uh, longest shuttle mission in this. Um, it managed, uh, against all odds, to deliver its payload successfully. Well, its payload being the two Kerbals, as far as actually getting the Dragon Capsule to the station, that's a different story. But anyway, descending. And the thing is, this was placed in a lower orbit. And I decided to use the KOS script anyway, even though I knew I couldn't reach the high orbit that the KOS script normally operates at. I thought because it was in a lower orbit and therefore would be interfacing with the atmosphere earlier that it would undershoot the KSC. As it turned out, it overshot the KSC. And I'm not, I'm still not entirely sure why. I suppose there's some sort of aerodynamic reason. But so we're splashing down in the Atlantic. There's no amount of turning. I'm trying to turn and not pull 15 G's at the same time. Uh, but there's no avoiding the fact that we're going to be dunking in the Atlantic again, which we have done. Now I have decreased the crash tolerance on the shuttle by a substantial amount. Um, even below the CSS shuttle parts and the stock parts. Nevertheless, it still manages to sl splash down fine, so... I don't know what other numbers to use, but... If it can do it, it can do it, I guess. 
I'm not gonna diminish its crash tolerance even more. I think I've reached my limit on that. After that, I decided to pull this mission into a lower orbit because it was just too hard to rendezvous with it in its extremely elongated orbit. That's gonna cause problems for escaping uh, lunar orbit and transferring over to Mars later because we're gonna have to burn more fuel to escape if we bring the orbit down here. And the ion engines were too tedious because you have to stop them at apoapsis and start burning them again at periapsis. So I decided to give its OMS engines a try to speed up the process and bring us down. So hopefully we won't have to use as much fuel to rendezvous with it as as we have been. We've been using like about 1,500 meters per second when it only takes 800 meters per second to make orbit around the moon. So anyway, that done, I was ready for the third mission, or I thought I was. The KOS script had been edited to make sure that it handles the roll off of pad 39A properly. And so things are looking up. These are all nighttime launches because of the location of the moon. It sort of depends on the time of year, whether we end up transferring to the moon in daylight or at night. The time of the month also determines whether we're going to meet up with the IMM at an opportune situation. Basically, we want our periapsis after TLI to be at the same location as the periapsis of the IMM. Then we, the maximum we would need to rendezvous with it would be um, like a thousand meters per second if we have to adjust the inclination a bit. But uh, so that would cut down on the delta V requirements a whole lot and increase our payload capacity to the moon. Uh, so as long as I could figure out the timing of that and make sure we just launch the shuttle once every month, that would uh, improve things quite a lot. Here we are making orbit properly because we are no longer using an infernal robotics hinge at the bottom of the centaur stage. So good times. Uh, this does not mean that releasing it was uneventful. As you can see, it sort of pops out there unlike anything else I've seen attached to a docking port. So that was weird. And remember how I told you to pay attention to the fact that normal staging worked to ignite the RL-10s before? Well, this time when I pressed spacebar, I decided to decouple that. <laughs> and so this is the first time that uh, we will not be able to send our payload to its intended location in this entire series. Uh, I decided to deorbit the Centaur stage since it was useless now. I should really just always use docking ports instead of decouplers, but... I decided to try and bring the payload back into the shuttle's cargo bay, but then I remembered how bad the RCS configuration on the Skylab TRS really is. Uh, in spite of the fact that I reconfigured it to use methane and oxygen, it's still just really badly balanced and not meant to tug a payload like this. So because it was too risky to bring it into the cargo bay of the shuttle, I decided to deorbit this, and because I changed the fuel, its uh, plumes aren't working right now. So yeah, that mission was a bust. Um, and oddly enough, we were in an awkward situation on deorbit. We reached the correct orbit, of course. Uh, this time we didn't have any payload wiggling out of the cargo bay hijinks. But in a situation I was totally not used to, we had too much fuel. So you heard me trying to dump it with ship manifest, but I didn't dump enough. Uh, ultimately, I dumped some more along the way, but still we ended up undershooting because the shuttle was a bit heavier. The, the script is supposed to be able to handle that, but I haven't come up with the numbers to accurately handle the extra mass. So we ended up splashing down short this time sort of balancing everything out because we ended up long the previous time in the Atlantic, this time we're in the Gulf of Mexico, short of Florida. So that's how these resupply missions to the IMM worked out, these first three resupply missions, all sorts of problems, and hopefully I can smooth things out in the future. So thank you for watching, I hope you enjoyed this video, if you did enjoy this video please do press like, and I'll see you next time.